Besieged Syrian areas are to receive much-needed aid. The Syrian government has agreed to give WHO workers access to hotspots. Will it be enough to end the humanitarian crisis, though, in war-torn Syria? And could it lead to other breakthroughs? This is Inside Story. Hello and welcome to the show. I'm Sami Zaydan. For months now, a lot of international attention on Syria has focused on the battle against ISIL. Syria's war is multiple fronts, though, and of course, the fighting is taking its largest toll on everyday Syrians. The World Health Organization now says it's been given permission by the Syrian government to deliver much-needed aid to civilians in Aleppo and Damascus. While well, thousands of people have been trapped by fighting in areas that were previously inaccessible because they were controlled by the opposition. Well, before we get into the discussion, Zeyna Khoda reports on the rise of infectious but treatable diseases in those besieged areas. Let's just warn you, though, you may find some of the pictures in her report to be disturbing. Hygiene-related diseases are on the rise in Syria. This girl was diagnosed with myiasis. It is a parasitic infection that is spread by flies. According to doctors, cases like these show how the crumbling healthcare system and the worsening living conditions, especially in rebel-held areas, are affecting people. We have no pesticides here because Ghouta is under siege. That is why there are many flies. Also, homes are not sterilized. There is no hygiene. One of the reasons is the lack of clean water in many places like eastern Ghouta. It is one of a few districts surrounding the capital under a government-imposed siege. The problem of contaminated water is not confined to rural Damascus. Across Syria, the World Health Organization reported more than 6,500 cases of typhoid this year. Hepatitis is also a problem. We have had serious problems with access to clean water in areas such as Aleppo, in the resort, and also in the rural Damascus area lately. have been damaged to the water and the sewage system, and often this is followed by uh, diseases. And we have seen uh, infectious diseases in the suburbs of Damascus. The WHO has been able to deliver three times more medical supplies in 2014 than it did last year. And some of the deliveries were to hard-to-reach areas. But health workers want the Syrian government to grant it more access to opposition territories. Some of these areas, when there is a security problem, it can be hard to access. We have had uh, some of the uh, convoys approved, but this has not been on a regular basis uh, because of security issues. And it is vital that supplies continue to reach those in need. More than half of the public hospitals are out of service. Syria's health care system has been severely damaged by the war, and many Syrians have died from treatable illnesses simply because of the lack of medicine. Well, let's bring in the guests into the discussion now. Joining me here in the studio is uh, Saleh Mubarak, member of the Syrian National Council. Joining us from Beirut is Joseph Kachishi, I'm columnist for the Gulf News and a specialist on Middle East affairs. And via Skype from Damascus is Haider Nasser, Chief of Health and Nutrition for UNICEF in Syria. Welcome to all of you. If I could start with uh, Mr. Haider. Is this a turning point for the humanitarian situation in Syria now that at least the WHO says it's being per given permission to uh, get aid into some of the, the difficult areas? Yes, indeed. Uh, also, we got permission to provide uh, health, nutrition, water and sanitation supply to uh, several areas in, in Aleppo, and this is very important breakthrough in, the, in terms of providing services to people in need, and especially those conflict-affected population in this governorate. All right, let's uh, clarify things a little bit. We know, since you said you've also been given permission, we know that difficult areas like Mwadhamir and Aleppo are on the li list. Where else will you be able to get aid into? Well, uh, there is a, a list of areas of a priority, especially for us in, in UNICEF, and we are in, in direct contact with the concerned uh, officials to get approvals. Uh, we 
got approval in, in several occasions. However, in some in some other uh, request, uh, these have been uh, denied because of security reasons. But lately, we have more approvals to access several places in, in Syria in general. All right. So how soon might we see aid getting into those difficult areas? Like, for example, I mentioned some uh, parts of the capital which have had one aid delivery in two years where people must really be suffering. I mean, how soon can people there expect to see UNICEF or WHO shipments coming in? Well, we are ready and all our supplies are uh, in our warehouses and some of them with the Syrian Red Crescent warehouses. And once we have the, the go ahead, we proceed and provide the needed items. So far, we provided uh, several convoys to, to different places, but you know, it is a process. It is not just like that. So I cannot give an exact date. We present a, a request for access. And once we receive the access, we proceed. From our side, we are ready. Okay, let's uh, bring the discussion to the studio here. Saleh, do you see this as a turning point, a breakthrough for the situation in Syria? Well, of course, it's better than nothing. Um, and, uh, you know, I, there are, as the report mentioned, about 12 million Syrians uh, who were displaced and about uh, 4.7 million or 5 million in hard to reach areas. And we hear horror stories from inside and outside Syria from those. But I think uh, my mind goes to stopping the root cause of, of this misery of, of the Syrian people. I mean, we can help now. But uh, more and more Syrians are, are uh, leaving their homes and more and more are, are heading towards uh, refugee camps inside and outside Syria. I think uh, in a parallel line to this humanitarian issue, there must be a political solution to force this, uh, to, to come with, with, with a solution that's acceptable uh, to all parties and, and uh, move on. Uh, stop the root cause of, of this human uh, tragedy. Treat the disease, don't put a Band-Aid on it. That's, that's, that's what you're that's basically correct. saying. Exactly. Let's uh, uh, talk with Joseph Kashishian now. What do you think changed to make uh, increased delivery of aid possible now? We've heard from our guest Haider that they're getting more permits or more permissions than before. We've heard from the WHO saying, you know, they're now getting permission to enter areas which have had very little aid lately. What's changed? Well, at least three things have changed. On the one hand, you have a, a full-fledged uh, attack against uh, Daesh in the north uh, of the country and the, and the uh, w east of the country, which means that a lot more attention is being devoted to the war itself. That frees the state to actually get some of its act together and respond to UNICEF and WHO requests to provide assistance. That's one thing. So wait the second minute, thing that uh, has sorry changed, to jump in here, Joseph. So you're basically saying on your first point there that this is a sign of the regime feeling more comfortable and confident. Regrettably, that is the case because the regime will only respond if it b believes that it is benefiting from this kind of an extension of assistance. So I, I, I say... Uh, that the regime is in fact feeling a lot more secure. That is why it is now tolerating, if you would like, the requests that is coming that are coming its way. But there are other equally two other equally important reasons. One, because the regime, no matter how awful uh, it might be perceived by outsiders, is also responsible to the disastrous health situation in the country. So far, we know that about 200,000 people have been more or less killed on the battlefield, but an equal number, perhaps even higher, perhaps up to 300,000 Syrians have lost their lives during the past four years because they lack medical attention. So if you put all of this together, you have in, on your hands a, a, small, a small holocaust where you have half a million Syrians have disappeared. That's a a very uh, compelling argument to present to the government officials to come to terms with it. And third and final point, which I think we sometimes uh, neglect uh, to, uh, to take into account, is that the government of Syria and the opposition forces find themselves in front of a huge dilemma. They have internal refugees and foreign refugees. And both of these groups, that is the government on the one hand and opposition forces, are not able to meet the requirements, the basic health and 
uh, and shelter requirements for their populations. Combined, all three of these issues lead us to where we are today in, in opening a small window uh, where some hopeful situation might arise. And as that small window opens, Haider, what sort of aid will you be able to take in? Will you be able to take in uh, new types of medication or supplies? And will it be enough, frankly, to meet the needs, all the needs of people in some of these areas? Well, we are providing health kit, emergency kit, uh, hygiene kit, nutrition supplies, midwife, midwifery kits, and uh, also uh, some uh, school-related items. Uh, the question whether this will be enough to all uh, needed, needed people there, no, I can say no, this is not enough. We need to expand more, to reach more people. Also, we need to, to generate more fund to respond to all the requirements. The need is very big uh, and it cannot be fulfilled by one partner. We need the cooperation of all to reach all those who are affected by this conflict. And, and perhaps also to clarify the situation, if aid now gets into eastern Rota, to Aleppo, to Muadzamiya on the outskirts of the capital, how much of Syria remains out of reach for aid agencies like yours? Well, it is difficult to estimate because the situation is changing every day. But whenever we have a green light to proceed, whenever the security situation allows, we proceed immediately, but I don't have an exact figure on how many people who are left without reach, because it is a, a continuous situation over here, and the, the events are changing every day. All right, uh, Saleh. If somebody can coordinate and there can be some mediation between the government and the opposition to allow aid convoys in because let's face it the uh, permits are needed from the government but you need obviously to have some coordination with some of the opposition groups that are holding this areas too right right so my question is if the, if this can be achieved for aid are we being foolish in thinking maybe there could be a breakthrough in other matters not just the delivery of aid well uh, hopefully it you know, we agree that uh, freezing or, or, or uh, uh, stopping the violence would be great. However, our... Uh, so you talk about the Demonstura plan. Well, sounds, um, um, right? yeah, there, there is a link. However, we are, we're very concerned about one serious issue, serious consequence of, of this, that it may um, enforce the status quo of the uh, partitioning or division, uh, divisioning Syria into areas. This area is controlled by the regime or the uh, Alawi uh, sect, and this uh, area is, is Kurdish, and this area is uh, Sunni, and so on. And, the balkanization uh, of balkanization. Syria. And, and we don't want to partition Syria. We uh, acknowledge and recognize and respect all the uh, groups the, the, uh, you know, that, that make up the Syrian uh, nation, all the religions, uh, sects, and, 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 and uh, ethnicities. Uh, but uh, we insist that Syria is one country and it should remain one country. And hopefully, uh, there will be a, a political solution to this that would get rid of the regime and uh, bring about uh, uh, a solution. Now, the people on the ground, the people uh, living there through this misery, uh, probably they're dealing with different, you know, those people living under the regime, the, those people living under ISIL or ISIS, those people under the Free Syrian Army or whatever, and they see, they, it's, it's kind of a test of what kind of, of uh, uh, people, and, and that would help probably sway the uh, populations, uh, you know, which which, which uh, you know, which group uh, they, they can t it put each uh, party mm. to the test. Uh, but eventually, eventually, I think all these um, enclaves have to come up with with uh, one national solution that will bring Syria back to, as as one country uh, without any division right. to freedom and democracy. All right, Joseph Kashishi, and you mentioned there some of the uh, uh, factors. I think it was three factors, changing factors in the dynamic. Do you see those factors leading to any sort of political opening or, or is this sort of progress going to be limited only to aid delivery? We are far from a permanent solution for the civil war in Syria simply because the two sides are on, uh, so far apart on different poles really. In the short term, we have a humanitarian crisis on our hands with a very serious health concern 
uh, let's remember that this is a winter. The weather is uh, inclement. Uh, there are lots of people who are uh, seeking shelter. Healthcare system is uh, pretty much on the ground. There isn't much of it going. I mean, I sometimes wonder what what people's what people really think when when an individual based on a normal basis gets gets ill and needs to see a doctor or needs to be rushed to the hospital and none of these care uh, system uh, systems are functioning so therefore we are we have a humanitarian crisis on our hand plus let us not forget that neighboring countries like turkey lebanon and uh, iraq to a certain extent but also jordan have huge refugees to deal with and that costs a lot of money as well so the humanitarian organizations have a great deal to do in the short term. Over the long term, there's got to be some kind of a solution. We're going to have to have a ceasefire, then some kind of a military solution, perhaps even a political solution down the line. But we're not there for the time being simply because neither the regime is willing to concede a single inch nor the opposition can tolerate to continue with the Ba'ath regime ruling over Syria. If you have these two very contradictory issues, in front of you, then I think you are compelled in the short term to really simply deal with the humanitarian crisis and think about the political solution at a later stage. In the short term, we really have got to get our act together. When I say we, I mean the international community to come to terms with this huge humanitarian crisis that Syria faces. All right, uh, Haider, Joseph mentioned their winter is approaching. Uh, bring us uh, a little bit of a reality check here in case we get too carried away in celebrating the delivery of aid perhaps to new areas. What sort of challenge of daily life still faces people, confronts people in the areas that you care for? Well, the winter is a big challenge is not only for those people who are affected by this conflict, but also for us, because we are planning to provide the winter, it winter items. We have a program called winterization, in which we provide blanket and other uh, heavy clothes uh, to those people affected and displaced. But uh, winter by itself is a challenge for us because you know the condition of the road, these are hard to reach area, very remote, in addition to the security situation. So it is like a, a, a both-ended uh, challenge. We are doing our best. We mobilized around $3 million just to provide uh, winter items to conflict, conflict affected population. But the access is an issue and we are pushing and trying to, to reach those people before the winter being so heavy on them. What do you need in order to uh, help people, particularly children, which your organization, of course, caters for? Yeah, uh, first of all, we, we need fund to provide the items, the, the supplies. And once the, the fund available, then we procure the items and then start to delivering these items to, to the affected people. Deliver these items to the affected people needs approvals and access. So it is like a, a chain of, of issues linked to each other. Once all the, all the factors are uh, available, then we can proceed and provide these items to those affected by the, by the war and the winter. All right, uh, Saleh, you may have heard there, I'm sure, at the beginning, jo Joseph was mentioning how the regime is feeling more comfortable, more confident, more able to uh, focus resources on other areas with this international fight going on against ISIL. Is that also weakening the position of groups like yours, the cards that you hold? in this conflict. Well, I agree with Mr. Keshishan's assessment. I think, unfortunately, uh, the regime feels more comfortable because the spotlight, the pressure is off the regime and on uh, uh, ISIS or ISIL. I think the regime has always played this, this game like I'm the lesser of the two evils. And we insist mm -hmm. that no, they are both evil, but the regime is, is more evil. The regime is responsible for the death of a lot more, hundreds of thousands you know, of, of people. Mm -hmm. We're not saying that ISIS uh, is, is, is an angel. No, they're not. But I think you cannot focus on fighting ISIS and leave the regime 
to stay and, 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 and get more, uh, you know, more help. But nevertheless, is the trend that groups like yours are becoming less relevant? The, the regime is getting stronger and we're seeing it's able to coordinate delivery of aid to areas with international organizations. What is the relevance left for the Syrian opposition as time goes by? Well, the relevance is that they still control some land. They have more perseverance than, than anyone else because it, to them it's, it's a life or death. They're not going to concede. And as we hear the, the, uh, uh, the battles on the ground, uh, you know, one day the regime wins here and one day the opposition. Now, recently in Wadi Daif, uh, Wadi Daif and uh, uh, Al Hamidiyah, Mosque Al Hamidiyah, the opposition has, uh, which, which is a very strategic location, the opposition has won the battle there and kicked the forces of, of Assad out. So uh, there is, there are losses on, on, on both sides, but I think we have more resolve, more perse perseverance, and to us uh, it's, it's a matter of uh, life or death. And, and, and the focus here uh, to, to us is, uh, the turning point really is, is Russia, because Russia and uh, several opposition groups have talked to Russia. And Russia is, is directly responsible for our misery, but at the same time we have to deal with Russia. It's, it's reality. And if Russia is convinced that uh, there a solution is, is, is uh, you know, they agree to a solution, I think that would be a breakthrough. So the, uh, you know, issue here, we're trying to come with, with a, a solution that I don't want to say pleases the Russians, but at least is acceptable to the Russians and acceptable to the other sides. And with uh, uh, the only condition that we insist on it, that uh, Bashar al-Assad and its uh, close allies, those who have blood on their hands, they have to leave. They cannot be part of the future Syria. All right. Uh, you mentioned an interesting point, which I want to take to Haider. As we see the world's attention uh, when it comes to Syria, focus Haider more on fighting ISIL. Does that negatively impact the campaigns that aid agencies uh, would like to get together to deal with, with the people who are suffering the most? Uh, is the world too focused on fighting rather than aiding? Well, uh Every fighting is affecting our uh, campaigns and our reach. Whenever there is a fight, mm. even with one bullet, this will affect access. Because, you know, we, we are humanitarian uh, workers. We, we need to reach people affected by, by the war and by the conflict. So whenever there is active fighting, in, in, in any kind of active fighting, this will affect our, our reach. So uh, whether it is the, the, the current uh, airstrikes on, on the uh, ISIL-controlled uh, area or whether it is any kind of current fighting, it will affect our, our access. How certain are you then, given what you said, that some of the permits that you've been given to deliver aid perhaps to areas which were very difficult in the past, that you'll actually be able to exercise that permission? Well, I cannot be 100% sure that we will reach X area in, 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 in certain time. We have a plan, we have, we have our supplies uh, ready, and we submit a request for access and for approval. And the situation is changing, and whenever we get approval mm. to, to reach, we, we will proceed. But there is not nothing 100%. Sometimes we proceed, and once we reach there, then there will be some security deterioration, and then we have to go back. So uh, there is nothing certain in, in this context. All right, Joseph Kashisha, we've got about 60 seconds. How is the mood changing amongst the people as they see what's going on in the battlefield and they see what's going on humanitarian-wise? Well, obviously, people are hopeful and they, they are hoping that uh, there will be some kind of a breakthrough. But the regime will continue to make grounds as long as the opposition forces uh, are disunited. I think that four years after the uprising and the civil war have started, the lesson to draw is very simple. The oppositions of Syria must really unite and speak with a single voice. As long as there are multiple oppositions in Syria, the regime will right. have an advantage that will continue until, until it can prevail. So we'll in order to prevent that, you need to get your act together. All right, we'll have to leave the discussion there. Let's thank our guests, Saleh Mubarak, Joseph Kashishian and Haider Nasser. And you can find this show and many more on our website. That's aljazeera.com. You can post your comments at facebook.com too forward slash AJ Inside Story. Or contact us on Twitter. Our handle is at AJ Inside Story. I'm Sami Zaydan. For now, thanks for watching and goodbye.